I think uh, it's always a bit difficult in the morning. People <laughs> Shall I share again, or do you guys have to say something before? Excuse me? Shall I share a screen again, or would you guys like to say something before that? Uh, yeah, no, it's Daniel. Yeah, just, uh, yeah, just introduce you. And we also Daniel is in charge. The code key into yeah. Into... Maybe we wait for two or three minutes. Uh, I still see yeah, people connected. That's true, because there are people coming uh, still, uh, where do you go now? Uh, should we get started or wait a little bit longer? Um, yeah, what do you guys think? Should we give it, uh, I mean, well, Stefan, what do you think? Should we start? Maybe, we'll give it a couple of more minutes, it's 8.02 now. Wait, wait until uh, 5 past or? Yeah, 8.05, yeah. Let's give it a bit of time because people are coming in. Yeah. We are still supposed to be in Greece, so. I guess. Well, <laughs> should we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It is time. Is it confusing? Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Uh, all right, so maybe let's go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks everybody for tuning in. We're very happy to have Atul Sharma as our first speaker this morning. He's going to tell us about taming uh, distributional celestial amplitudes. So take it away, Atul. Right. So thank you again for inviting me. Thanks to all the organizers. This is really my first ever conference, so it's an honor. And thank you everyone else for waking up this early in the States. I'm going to talk about um, celestial amplitudes in a basis of light transformed boost eigenstates, the kind of thing that has been in the air over the last few months or so. So this is based on my work in July. Okay. So to begin with some motivations and some basic background. In uh, celestial holography, as you've seen yesterday, we start with the uh, momentum eigenstates, a scattering process of momentum eigenstates. So in particular, you can have massless particle momentum eigenstates labeled by an energy. Uh, you can hear me, right? I'm not muted or anything, right? You can begin with momentum eigenstates with labeled by an energy, an angular position labeled by a complex coordinate Z on the celestial sphere along with its complex conjugate and uh, its helicity label and, and a label epsilon that just tells you whether the momentum vector is future or past pointing or whether it's a positive or negative frequency state. And the idea in celestial holography is to Mellon transform it into what is called nowadays a boost eigenstate, which is basically something that transforms conformally covariantly under a conformal transformation of the celestial sphere, which can be identified with Lorentz transformations in Minkowski space. And the conjecture of celestial CFT is that there is a conformal field theory living on the celestial sphere, which contains states or local operators uh, curly O epsilon H H bar Z Z bar that are actually dual to these boost eigenstates uh, where H and H bar are these conformal weights. It should be familiar. But the question naturally arises, are these, is the conjecture that states that these are the local operators of CCFT really true or is there something that we have to be careful about? So, uh, it could just have been some kind of a historical accident that we landed on this Mellon basis as the first as, and as the most natural and simplest thing. But as you already know, there are these shadow transforms which are induced from, uh, there are shadow transforms that take you from one representation of the conformal group, which is labeled by these weights, to another representation, which has the same conformal casimirs, but which are labeled by a different conformal weights. And uh, you could equivalently have said that these would be dual to some uh, bulk states, and these bulk states might secretly be dual to some local operators. Because if you look at this shadow transform, then it is a non-local, superficially, it is a non-local coordinate um, a non-local integral transform, but it only depends on one particular point on the celestial sphere. So had you started, instead of this Mellon basis, had you first started with the shadow basis, you might have said that these are the local states in our, or local operators in our celestial CFT. And there is a natural point of confusion here as to which particular local fundamental basis of states we should work with. And this becomes even more confusing in uh, Lorenzian signature or in, this becomes even more confusing in 2-2 signature bulk space-time where the boundary is actually a celestial torus and you are actually dealing with a Lorenzian CFT. So on the boundary, you have these Z and Z bar coordinates. They turn into real independent coordinates instead of complex conjugate coordinates. And now you have a boundary metric, which is just DZ, DZ bar, and you're dealing with a Lorenzian CFT, which has on a celestial torus, which you can open up into a square. And then you can think about null G D6 on this celestial torus. 
and you can do all sorts of Lorentzian things here. Now in Lorentzian signature, by which I mean two dimensional Lorentzian signature, you can have more integral transformations that map you from one representation of the conformal group to another. And these are called light transforms. And if you look at these, these are very closely related to the shadow transform, but they're sort of a half or a chiral half of the shadow transform. So you integrate over either one NLG D6, either one particular NLG D6 or the other one. And you could have said that these are dual to maybe local operators or local states in the you could have said that these might be my local basis of operators in my celestial CFD because superficially, even these appear to depend only on one point on the celestial topes. So where have they appeared before? So over the last few months, we have seen that shadow transforms have been related to uh, two point functions and some kind of an adjoint operator in 2D celestial CFD. And uh, they've also been used for gluon conformal block expansions to try to turn uh, the distributional dependence of the four point gluon amplitude into something much more familiar from usual CFT. So this was described by Taylor yesterday. Whereas light transforms have been observed in scalar conformal block expansions. Uh, and uh, they've also been observed to be useful for some reason, for some mysterious reason, to unravel the symmetries of self-dual CFD. So it turned out that if you take uh, the symmetry generators, the soft theorems or the soft modes uh, on the celestial sphere and you light transform them, then somehow they gave rise to a much more natural algebra that looked like that was the algebra of W infinity. So it seems that there's a natural reason to try to study celestial amplitudes and celestial states, uh, the celestial Hilbert space in terms of these uh, integral transformed operators. So today I'm going to talk about light transformed celestial amplitudes uh, in a particular basis called the ambidextrous basis that I will describe. And this basis will be chosen by the simple requirement that I'll try to turn as many celestial amplitudes uh, that are distributional in the celestial kinematics. I'll try to turn as many of them as possible into something that look like natural conformal uh, correlators. Oh. Some, and uh, then I'll discuss light transform celestial OPE. And uh, in the end, de uh, depending on how much time I have left, I will discuss some connections with twisted theory. Okay. So firstly, just to recall, a celestial amplitude is basically, the original celestial amplitudes are defined by taking a momentum space amplitude, appending it with the momentum conserving delta function. So in my notation here, epsilon i are again the signs. Omega is the energy that I'm going to Mellon transform in, and Q is the angular, the embedding of the celestial torus in this case into the bulk space time. Li are the helicities and these are momentum conserving delta functions as usual. And uh, this is the usual celestial amplitude. But what I'm going to do today is to do a particular set of light transforms on this amplitude. So this will correspond to taking a conformal correlation function of a particular set of light transformed uh, operator boost eigenstate operators in the celestial CFT. So the prescription that I'm going to make is that for every positive helicity gluon or graviton. So firstly, this will only work for spinning particles because I need, in some sense, I need two types of particles here. So for every positive helicity particle, I'm going to light transform along the geodesic in W, along the geodesic W bar equals constant. And, uh, for every negative helicity gluon or graviton, I'm going to light transform in W bar. So along the geodesic W equals constant. And uh, this choice I've been calling ambidextrous, but feel free to call it whatever you like. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so two, 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 two questions. Um, one is um, you, you could also do this couldn't you with uh, massless scalars? Of course, you'd have an ambiguity about which side to 
or any particle, right? Yeah. Yeah, I could I, I could do it, yes. But okay. um, the ambiguity, I do not know how to resolve that ambiguity. Or yeah. And the other thing is if I understand yeah. you're doing you're doing the opposite of what I did, which side you're light transforming on. Is that correct? That is also true, yes. Does it matter here? Could you have done it the other way? So if we did it the other way, then the delta functions in the three-point uh, correlation function won't get absorbed by the light transform integrals. So which light transforms? I'll show it in an example on the next slide that mm -hmm. it, depending on which light transform you do, like you have to do an integral over W1 bar and W2 bar if you want to use up the delta functions in Z bar one, two, and Z bar one, three, and things like that. I'll show it in an example. Okay. So I hope the prescription is clear, but I'll, yeah, let me make, get some examples. So for gluons, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a notation where I have an amplitude where my uh, ZI and ZI bar variables, I'm just going to label it as I. My, subs, my subscripts will be delta and L, and my superscript will be epsilon. Uh, if you get confused, just ask me later. Any such amplitude is going to be proportional to, so in the gluon case, it's going to be proportional to delta of beta, where beta is an overall boost, conserve, uh, an overall conserved boost charge. And in the graviton case, this will be a shift, slightly shifted boost charge, but the same quantity beta will appear again. So now uh, I'll show you the miracle or the magic of this particular prescription. So for example, at two points, I've considered some simple examples. You can take the first particle to be a positive helicity gluon, which is incoming, and uh, the second particle to be a negative helicity gluon, which is outgoing. And the celestial amplitude looks something like this. It has a delta of beta, where beta is uh, J rank of one to two. And uh, it has delta of Z, uh, Z1 minus Z2 and delta of Z1 bar minus Z2 bar. And the prescription, exactly absorbs these two delta functions. So if you look, I'm light transforming in W1 or the, uh, the Z coordinate of the first particle. There's a delta function here, uh, which will use up, which will get used up against this W1 integral to get a simple power law dependence. And then there's a W2 bar integral for the second particle, the negative velocity particle, and that also gets used up. So, okay. In this two-point case, Andy's uh, uh, problem, uh, the thing Andy mentioned doesn't really pop up, but in the three-particle case, it actually shows up much more vividly. So in the three-gluon three case, I've chosen to work with a simple example. Um, it should be interesting to work out all the other configurations as well, but just in this case, you take, uh, I've taken uh, a three-point amplitude where the first two gluons are negative helicity and incoming, and the third gluon is positive helicity and outgoing. And the celestial amplitude looks like this. It has a pair of heaviside step functions that impose uh, some kind of kinematic constraints on the uh, following from momentum conservation in momentum space. And then there are some delta functions that impose leftover momentum conservation. So the point is that the delta functions here are in Z bar. And so you want to do a particular set of light transforms that absorb exactly these delta functions. Doing the other ones would not help with the distributional dependence here. So that's why you light transform in w, um, so W1 bar and W2 bar. You have delta functions here in W1 bar minus Z3 bar and W2 bar minus Z3 bar. And that's exactly what gets absorbed here. And that's why I had to do this set of light transforms and not the other way around. Um, and then there's the third integral, which actually is a non-trivial integral. So what I've done here is I've also used up the two heaviside step functions. The step functions basically impose that this third integral, the third integration variable w W3 lie between Z1 and Z2. Now, depending on whether Z1 is greater than Z2 or less than Z2, you get a different orientation for this integral, which actually can be compensated by just putting a sign of Z12 by hand inside here and just having the integral run from Z2 to Z1 in either case. And once you do this integral, 
a priori uh yeah you're muted i think uh you're muted yeah sorry when z3 is between z2 and z1 you are hitting uh, singularity in the denominator you're integrating over dw3 and uh, you are crossing branch point what yeah what, so is this your gives, uh, what, do, what do you do so what i've done is basically just use the hypergeometric function formula i mean this just turns into a standard hypergeometric 2f1 integral but on what branch you are because you have w3 minus oh yeah Z3. I have, um, oh, I just made a choice of, uh, I mean, I haven't sort of written it like a hypergeometric function, but I've just made a choice of branch, uh, which is, I mean, I didn't make any complicated choice of branch. I just, uh, I just did an integral substitution, W3 equals Z, uh, Z2 plus some integration variable times z12 and that sort of brings it into the standard hypergeometric function integrand form and then i just chose to work with this branch that the integrand gave me but you're right in more complicated scenarios one might have to have an i epsilon prescription here which might require you to change your contour as well and uh, select your branch carefully as well you see, this will become much more serious when you have more points because then the order, then the result of this integration, which depend on yeah. the order in which you take the, 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 the these transforms. That's the, in general, the problem with light transforms is that when H is not integer or half integer, you have the, the you don't know what, it's, it's not well defined. Because yes, exactly. you don't know on what branch you are, yes. So that is somehow showing up here in some way, yes. Uh, in, yes, indeed. And in fact, uh, if you try to do the other sort of cases, I like this naive sort of calculation that I've done here wasn't immediately working. So it seems that you do need to change, choose a branch carefully. If you try to do the calculation where, say, a negative helicity particle is as a plus here is incoming and uh, the positive velocity particle is outgoing, then it does seem that you need a more careful choice of branch. But um, yeah, I don't have any more informed opinion right now. I'm still looking at these things. That's fine. In just in this simple case, it turns out that you can convert this integral very quickly into a standard hypergeometric integral. And uh, again, if you're uncomfortable with this, you could just try to set delta one, delta two, delta three to be real parameters, and then just say that you're analytically continuing. And you're right that the final answer has branch cuts because of these deltas being complex variables, but yeah. Uh, maybe you can help me with this later. <laughs> yes. So in uh, in Lorentzian signature, uh, do you also require the deltas to be living on the principal series? I think so. Uh, yes. Okay. Is there? Did you have something else in mind? No, I didn't. I, uh, it's just not something that's obvious to me. That's all. So I just wanted to, because usually oh, you say that something's on the principal series because you want these states, these Mellon transformed operators to have finite norm and the norm depends right, on the right. setting. So now if I recall to... the representation theory would just say that L also becomes a complex parameter, but the range of delta sort of stays the same, like a complete set of representations. The range of delta should stay the same, but L also, the spin also becomes a complex parameter in addition. So I think that's the only change that happens when you go from SO D plus one one to S O D comma two. But why why should we be restricting to the principal series? I mean, if we try to do that in gravity, there is no three fun function at all. And um, generally, uh, we'd like just, to analytically continue, right? That is also true. 
No, I think he was just asking for about a complete basis kind of statement, whether the principal series is the correct thing to look at in Lorentz signature, if you look, want a complete basis of states. But of course, you have to get away from the principal series in all cases of interest. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the questions. So <clears throat> the point is in this simple enough case, you can actually fairly quickly do the, turn this integral into a standard hypergeometric integral. But it so happens that on the support of delta of beta, the hypergeometric integral further simplifies magically into a simple conformally covariant power law dependence. And there is something non-trivial about this that I haven't been able to reproduce in the case where one of the negative LSD particles is incoming. So there is something interesting happening here, which should be related to the problems about branch cuts and so on. But let me move on in, uh, for time. So the nice thing you see is that this beta function pops up and uh, I'll try to compare this with the celestial OPE in a bit. And similarly, you get the parity conjugate amplitude. So the nice thing about this prescription of light, this ambidextrous prescription was that it's parity symmetric. So you can easily read off the parity conjugate amplitude from here, which I'll use to derive the plus plus OPE in a bit. Uh, so some of the observations that I've already mentioned here is that the ambidextrous prescription absorbs all the momentum conserving delta functions and it brings the amplitudes to the standard conformally covariant power law form, at least in these uh, basic examples that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And you can finally read the light transform celestial OP directly from this. So unlike the case of the usual celestial amplitude, where if you try to take the two-point and the three-point celestial amplitudes, and you try to take a collinear limit of the three-point celestial amplitude, it's highly distributional. It's highly unclear how it is some OPE coefficient times the two-point amplitude. But in this case, it's very clear. You basically just take a collinear limit in say Z12 and Z bar 12, and it fairly quickly reduces to something like this L2 with the appropriate kinematic dependence. Yeah, uh -huh. Uh, um, I just have a question about the sign Z12. Are we supposed to expect the right-hand side of this to be, you know, to transform like a three-point function of a CFT just with respect to symmetries? Mm. I'm, just, I'm just trying the to understand side... how, if I, if I do a conformal transformation which changes the sign of Z bar 1, 2, how, how do both sides of this transform? I suppose my question. Well, in split signature, if I recall correctly, the conformal transformations leave the sign factors invariant because the, at least positive conformal rescalings. So I usually work with the spinner notation. So in my mind, I, I replace Z bar one, two by spinner contractions, one, two, and things like that. And then a conformal rescaling is just like a positive rescaling of that. And, conf and uh, uh, SL2 transformations leave the bracket invariant anyway. And the sign factors, if you think about it carefully, are just invariant under those. No, but, but the bracket uh, is invariant more... only if you have, you also have factors of square root omega, the energy, right? So it's, it's not invariant. The Z12 is not separately invariant. You have to include the factors of the energy uh, that come along in the, in the bracket. No, if you do conformal transformations, you can represent them as spinners and then, uh, a conformal yeah, but the spinner bracket, the spinner bracket like is that. equal to sorry, the spinner bracket is equal to square root omega one omega two times z one two, and this oh no yeah that's true. Omega I'm omega. just saying that you can represent this z bar one to itself as a spinner bracket where you've set oh. omega to one, and then oh. you can just act with a conformal transformation. So just uh, just the two component spinner z comma one, just that thing. The conformal transformation acts like a Mebius transformation on that, right? And it's just in uh, and the bracket of these two things is invariant under these Mebius transformations. And any conformal, any positive conformal rescaling leaves the sign of Z bar one to invariant. Okay. I think there's more discussion on this in the. There are these sign factors popping up even in uh, uh, the 
gluon conformal correlators as 2D, gluon amplitudes as 2D conformal correlators paper. So I think this is so the same I think issue. The sign is, you, you have this very nice OPE, basically you're saying the OPE is not associated. Is that, is that a correct understanding of what you're saying? So not, so it's not commutative, of course, it's not commutative. Because if I, if I, if I exchange Z1 and Z2, then the right-hand side changes by a minus sign. Right, that should happen. I okay. mean, even if you have a one over Z bar one, two, or any dependence on Z bar one, two, the OP is not going to be commutative in that sense, right? It's just that this, ha this, this has, there's some leftover dependence. It's just not singular, but it's like some sign dependence. Okay. Monica? Yeah, I think actually that sign is needed to be there for um, uh, spin statistics, right? Because these are gluons and they're going to have an FABC. And so you should be oh, able I to exchange. Them. No, no, no but that. when you when you put, we exchange one and two, it needs to be uh, symmetric. And so the FABC will get a sign and the Z12 will. Cancel that, that makes, sign. Ah, that makes sense. So I think you oh, need that's that. That's nice. Okay. Thanks. I hadn't noticed that either. Okay. Yeah, you're right. If you exchange these two operators, like just exchange their labels, then you will have to exchange FAB to FBAC. Wait, but Thanks. would it be true if we've we, got if about we five minutes? Right. If we took um, a contour integral of Z2 around Z1, that we would we would get back the two point function. That's what we would want. Uh, isn't it? Sorry, could you repeat that? If we took the contour integral of Z2 over Z, uh, if, we made, if we made one of these soft and took the contour right. integral of Z2 around Z1, we should get back the two point function. I, I'm not sure if this sign is a problem for that or not. Hmm. Yeah, I'm I mean, is the sure. soft theorem consistent? Well, we don't know if the soft theorem makes sense in the light transform basis. We haven't, well, I guess Monica's paper started checking this, but yeah, we still need to sort of find the action of a soft current on a light transform and check what the, so this is a light transform, light transform will be, I think we still need to find the action of a soft current on another light transform primary. To check what that gives us. Hmm. Okay. Uh, sorry, as you realize, I still have there are still a lot of confusions about this business, and this is literally just a starting point. But let me try to finish just the light transform part, since I'm not going to be able to reach the twister part. So we can read off this OP by just taking the OP limit of this uh, by taking Z1 and Z2 collinear, and you can get something that's proportional to the corresponding two-point amplitude with a beta function. And similarly, you can do graviton examples where just going quickly here, in the graviton case, you have a similar two-point function analysis that doesn't change much. And in the three-point function case, the only drastic change is that the sign of Z bar one, two is replaced by a modulus of Z bar one, two. And this is actually reminiscent of the twister story from an old paper of Erkani Hamid and uh, company as well, which I might mention later. But other than that, this amplitude remains more or less the same. And you can check uh, that on the support of this delta function, all its conformal weights are fine. And from this, you can read the celestial OP of a pair of light transform gravitons, which now has a modulus of Z bar one, two instead of the sine, which is the same kind of change when you go from one over Z bar. Uh, okay, yeah, it's on this slide. So now just for comparison, I have presented here the original celestial OP of two operators dual to boost eigenstates. And these are the celestial OP dual to light transformed uh, boost eigenstates. And now you see that, at least naively speaking, it appears that you could have obtained these OPs by sort of light transforming these OPs directly, 
or at least uh, as Monica in a uh, recent paper has shown uh, in this Pedro Clarius from and Yan. Oh, sorry, not that one. Um, Paid him which and sing. Yeah, I think. Um, as they have shown, you can actually take this RPE and you can sort of add all the conformal descendants and you can resum and you can get an OP between at least one light transform and another primary. So similarly, there's some sort of hope that you could, if you knew all the conformal descendants in this uh, OP or boost eigenstate, you might be able to light transform it systematically and get back these OPs along with the sign factors somehow. It's actually true that I'm not completely clear how the sign factors would emerge from just light transforming the OPEs, but it's quite encouraging that you do get the same beta functions that appear here to appear here as well. And it's very nice that these beta functions now appear in these celestial amplitudes as OPE coefficients uh, uh, in their full glory instead of the usual celestial amplitudes, where it was much more unclear where the beta function was hiding. Okay, I, how much time? I'm over time, I suppose. Uh, yeah, you're at 30 minutes, but you had a lot of questions. So you could take a little bit to wrap up. So just five more minutes, I'll talk about the testorial motivations of this ambitextrous transformation. So the testorial motivation comes from what is called Witten's half Fourier transform. To set it up, recall that you have your usual spinner helicity uh, variables for any massless momentum P alpha alpha door. You can decompose it into lambda and lambda bar spinners, where in 2 2 signature, they're real and independent two component spinners. Witten's half Fourier transform basically takes a momentum eigenstate and uh, convolves it with a Fourier transformation. So it Fourier transforms in lambda bar and gives you some kind of a, uh, uh, gives you what is called a twister eigenstate, which is labeled by lambda and the Fourier conjugate mu, which is called a twister coordinate. So I've indexed these with a T here for reasons that will become clear on the next slide. Uh, the nice thing about these FISTA eigenstates is that they transform homogeneously under little group scalings. So the little group of lambda and lambda bar here is just uh, scaling lambda up and lambda bar down by some real non-zero parameter. You can show that the little group of FISTA eigenstates is actually just scaling the Z coordinate which is just the collection. So I've defined a twister Z to be just the four component object with mu and lambda put together. And the little group of this is literally just an overall scaling of Z. And these twister eigenstates transform homogeneously under such scalings. And you can prove this using the scaling properties of momentum eigenstates and this transform in this Fourier transform. So since the states only depend on the overall scaling of uh, Z, there are actually elements of RP3. Now you can similarly define conformal primary twist eigenstates by basically the same procedure as you do for going from momentum eigenstates to boost eigenstates. You take the little group scaling and you use it to fix uh, the scale of the, the twister. So you take mu and you fix the second component of mu to one by using your little group scaling. And just on a whimsy, call the first component of mu to be z bar. You have lambda, which has two independent components. You can call the second component of lambda as some sine epsilon times some positive number omega. And the ratio between the first and second components you can just define to be your original z. And a conformal primary twister eigenstate is then defined by uh, what I've called a half million transform which is literally just a Mellon transform in this frequency omega with this particular weight 2H. And the magical thing is that this transforms with this, this actually transforms conformally covariantly and it transforms with the same conformal weights as the light transformed state, this particular light transformed state, uh, Z, Z bar H1 minus H bar epsilon. So the L bar state. So this makes us wonder if we can somehow express these twister eigenstates in terms of light transformed eigenstates. 
And indeed, this can be done. Uh, my original hope was that the twist eigenstates might be directly proportional to the light transformed eigenstate, but that's not true. In fact, what really happens is that a twist eigenstate can be sort of refined in terms of a linear combination of two light transform eigenstates. Where one of them is outgoing and the other one is incoming with respect to the original eigenstate. So uh, this was also the original motivation for the ambidextrous prescription in the sense that these Twista eigenstates have had a long history. They've been used by, in particular, they've been used by Erkani Hamid, Kachaza, Chang, and Kaplan to take gluon and graviton amplitudes. You, what they did is they took all the positive helicity gluons and they twist to transform, uh, they half Fourier transformed them like I did here on two slides ago in lambda bar. And they took all the negative helicity gravitons or gluons and they half Fourier transformed it in lambda. And that takes you to what is called dual twist space. And then that sort of gave you very simple expressions that also absorbs all the momentum conserving delta functions in that case, which sort of where what was which sort of gave me the motivation for using this, introducing this ambidextrous prescription. There also you have the same problem. You have lots of delta functions that you need to absorb. And this prescription successfully absorbs that. And then it actually organizes the twister amplitudes, as they call it, or the ambitwister amplitudes into what is called the Grismanian formula or the link representation. So it sort of gives rise to uh, it sort of unravels a lot of hidden geometry in their case associated to the Grismanian representation of amplitudes. So I thought that this was also an interesting point to make. And this was mainly motivational from the viewpoint of the original ambidextrous prescription for light transforms. There's also a hope that this might have something to do with the success of twisted strings. It might secretly be implying that celestial holography has something to do with the success of twisted strings, but of course, only time will tell. So the last few points that I wanted to make in my summary is that um, the question that I asked at the beginning of my talk was, what's a local operator? Now, it seems that in the basis of light transform boost eigenstates, conformal uh, the celestial amplitudes look much more like the usual conformal correlation functions that we are familiar with, the usual power law forms. So it might be that these light transform boost, eigenstate, boost eigenstates may be the correct basis to use. Of course, I'm not going to just claim that right now, because it's still true that these light transforms give you objects of complex spin. So it's not clear in what sense I should call them local operators generating states in the Hilbert space. But it's interesting to see that in this basis, the celestial amplitudes are taking the simplest form, and they're also manifesting all their OPE coefficients much more clearly. And finally, there's something to say about the twistorial origins of, there's some speculations that I would like to make that these W infinity symmetries that Andy will discuss later on uh, today, I think, uh, these are also the symmetries of these two planes coordinatized by these mu alpha dot coordinates in twister space. So it turns out that these mu alpha dot coordinates just coordinatize some R2, and these W infinity symmetries that the MHV amplitude or the scalar scalar in self dual gravity inherits actually come from symplectic diffeomorphisms of these two planes coordinatized by mu alpha dot. And so, since the light transform is somehow taking us to twist space, as I showed on my previous slide, it is very plausible that somehow the it's taking the soft charges to their twistorial counterparts, and these twistorial counterparts are somehow generating these simple acting as generators of symplectic diffeomorphisms in the mu alpha dot coordinates. So tune into my supervisor's talk tomorrow for the story in Lorenzian signature using some twister string models, but otherwise it's still an open question and it'll be interesting to see where it leads. Thanks for listening. And uh, yeah. All right, thank you, Atul, for the great talk. Yeah. Thanks.
we had a lot of questions and we're a little bit short on time. So maybe maybe we can do one question, a short one. Anybody has anything left? Um, am I, sorry, as chairman, am I, am I allowed to talk or should it be somebody else? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, sorry, I just uh, want to go back to Andy's question about whether you go to Twisters or Dual Twisters. And I, I just want to really make the comment that the distinction between the paper that you cited from David, and my, David Skinner and myself in 2009 and the uh, uh, Nima, Freddie Nima and Friends one was this, uh, uh, we, yeah, we, we went awesome. entirely to Twister Space, so you can go entirely to Twister Space, but then as you comment, you do get some, um, uh, uh, some distributional support. So, um, and that distributional support is actually probably the best way to see the Grassmannian formulation. So we ended up having dependence on a two, two N minus four cycle uh, represented in terms of BCFW parameters in our paper. Whereas in their paper, they were trying to get rid of the distributional support as you were. So I think you can yeah. sort of regard that choice as being, you can pay your money and make your choice and uh, you, you'll get different. So the link representation was beautiful for other reasons. And I think a lot of people found it very compelling. So you pay your money and take your choice as to what you want to do there. But if you wanted a theory that was purely on Twister space, maybe you go to Twister space, whereas if you wanted on Ambi Twister space, you would do some one way and some the other. So that's more of a comment than a question, I guess. Right, here also you could try to just do light transforms in all the particles and that would get rid of the distributions in the MHV three-point amplitude, but not get rid of the distributions in the MHV bar three-point amplitude. Right. But this right. ambidextrous prescription beautifully gets rid of the distributions in both. Yeah. Right. So that's like the link representation, which, yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, maybe in, in the interest of time, we should move on, but let's all thank Atul again. For a great talk. Uh, and Kevin, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, great. Uh, so our next. To, yeah, I need to make. Um, okay. Co host. Kevin, you should be all set now. Okay, I'm gonna share the screen. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, let me know if I can start. Yep, yeah, we should be good to go. Our next speaker is Kevin Nguyen. He's going to tell us about celestial IR divergences and the effective action of super translation modes. Take it away. Okay, thanks. Uh, hi, everyone, and thanks for having me today. So the title, well, uh, Dan just uh, told it. Um, and it's work based on a paper that appeared in May, written in collaboration with uh, Jacob Salzer. Uh, so the motivation of our work is um, mostly this recent proposal for the for the two point function of the super translation mode, uh, which uh, was proposed in a paper by uh, Himwich et al. Uh, so let me first tell you a bit about this uh, before getting to to our own work. Um, so. In the context of um, gauge theories and uh, in particular gravity, there is a soft factorization of uh, scattering amplitudes. So a generic scattering amplitude uh, factorizes into a hard part and a soft part where the soft part carries all dependencies on um, soft uh, particles and uh, IR divergences. Uh, and in the case where you have, let's say, n hard external particles and an arbitrary number of soft uh, internal virtual gravitons, it's an old result from Weinberg that uh, the soft factor takes a very nice exponential form, um, 
where you have a sum here that runs over all uh, external particles. Uh, eta i here is just plus minus one, depending whether the particle is ingoing or outgoing. Omega i is the energy of the particle, and x i is um, the coordinate on the celestial sphere. So it's a stereographic coordinate on the celestial sphere at which the particle enters or exits uh, space time. Uh, and in addition, in front of this, you have uh, G Newton and the logarithm of uh, need for it uh, cutoff, uh, cutoff uh, which has to be sent to infinity at the end of the computation. Uh, so if you, if you send this uh, IR regulator to infinity, at this, uh, at this step, then you get that the soft factor vanishes, uh, which is bad because that would mean that uh, the, the amplitude vanishes. Uh, but it's known that the way to, to go around it is to consider inclusive uh, observable. So you also consider an arbitrary number of, uh, of emitted soft gravitons, so external soft gravitons. And when you sum all these amplitudes together, then the, the soft factor, uh, the soft factors cancel out, and you're left with uh, actually a hard, so only only the hard part of the of the amplitude. Uh, so in addition to the to this uh, old story, there is this uh, there are these recent uh, realizations that the soft factor can actually be written as the expectation value of the product of uh, vertex operators. So there is uh, W for each hard particle. And uh, it's the exponential, basically, of the super translation field. Uh, so it's a field valued over the celestial sphere. And when you plug this, well, when you like uh, re-express this expectation value, you can put it in this form, so the exponential uh, of a sum involving the uh, two-point function of this uh, super translation field. And comparing with uh, Weinberg's old result, one can infer the form of the, uh, the two-point function, and that's what uh, has been done in, in this paper. And the two-point function is, uh, so there is G Newton log of this IR uh, regulator, and then uh, some x square log x uh, dependence. In particular, it's, uh, it's a correlator which, is, which diverges for large separations. Uh, all right, so uh, that's, uh, of course, very interesting. And what we wanted to understand was whether uh, it's possible to derive this two-point function, let's say, more directly from, uh, from GR, actually, uh, rather than going through this uh, uh, business of scattering amplitudes and then uh, inferring the form of the two-point function from Weinberg's result. So that's our basic question. Uh, and in answering it, we also uh, had to face another set of questions. Um, so in particular, when you ask about two-point functions, you're asking about basically dynamics. So what is the dynamics of the super translation Goldstone mode? Uh, is there an effective boundary action for it? And we have uh, really related work uh, for the super rotation uh, Goldstone mode. If you're, if you're interested. Um, what is the relation between uh, the dynamics of the Goldstone mode and IR divergences? Is there an intrinsic formulation of the celestial CFT uh, that is not based on rewriting scattering amplitudes in flat space uh, in a conformal basis? And uh, is there a formulation of celestial holography for nonlinear gravity? A bit uh, as what exists for ADS CFT. And I believe we've made progress on, on all these fronts, and I, uh, that's what I'm going to uh, describe to you now. Um, 
All right, so, but before going into the details, uh, since Andy has given us a taste for uh, triangles, let me uh, provoke your curiosity with uh, this triangle, which I call the IR divergent triangle. So uh, it describes a set of relations between uh, the dynamics of the Goldstone modes, uh, the IR divergent part of uh, scattering amplitude, so the soft uh, factor basically, and uh, what we have uh, kind of uncovered in our work, the IR divergent part of the uh, action for general relativity. Uh, but that, yeah, I, I, I'll come to that. All right, so <clears throat> uh, I'll describe the setup that we use. So it's basically uh, gravity near spatial infinity. And uh, the well posed action principle for it. Then, from this uh, well posed action principle, we're going to identify uh, an effective action that uh, governs the super translation mode. And from this uh, effective action, uh, I will argue that uh, we can uh, formulate through path integrals, at least one sector of the celestial CFT, namely uh, that of soft factors. And I'll conclude with a summary and some open questions. Okay, so uh, the setup we're using is the following. Uh, schematically, uh, it's schematically this one. So this is part of the Penrose diagram of uh, some asymptotically flat space time. You have uh, spatial infinity I not here. Uh, null infinity, scry plus, and scry minus. And um, we want to have a well-posed action principle. So that means that we have to specify some boundaries and be careful about boundary terms. Uh, the region we're considering is uh, this yellow region uh, close to, to sp uh, spatial infinity. Uh, it's bounded by two Cauchy surfaces sigma plus and sigma minus, and uh, one outer boundary h plus and one inner boundary h minus. And these, uh, as I will describe in a moment, have natural geometry of uh, three-dimensional de Sitter space. Uh, and at the intersection of the Cauchy surfaces and these de Sitter hyperboloids, you have uh, two spheres. Uh, which in the limit where the outer boundary is sent to infinity are mapped to the celestial sphere. Uh, all right. So now in equations, the way to efficiently describe uh, spatial infinity is through the so-called Bike-Schmidt gauge. So you see it's just an ADM decomposition where uh, rho is the radial coordinate. Uh, so on the previous slide, rho equal lambda plus uh, is this outer boundary. Rho equal lambda minus is this inner boundary. Uh, and then there is a choice of, uh, of gauge conditions and uh, uh, right that, so, okay, so sorry. Um, so there is this, radial coordinate rho, and you can asymptotically expand all the functions uh, in power series. So all solutions of Einstein gravity admit this decomposition. And uh, well, there is a set, uh, choice of gauge that uh, only keeps a small subset of the possible uh, function in the expansions. So here in the shift, we have sigma, which is the electric potential. Uh, I will explain that in a moment. And uh, in the uh, transverse metric on the Decitor hyperboloid, you have the leading metric HAB, and then you have uh, subleading terms. And in particular, Einstein's equations imply that HAB is the metric of the Decitor space. And this will be considered a fixed background structure, uh, which is not fluctuating. 
Okay, so <clears throat> there are two important quantities that will that uh, I will discuss. There is the electric potential, and there is uh, what is called the magnetic potential. So it's a combination of H one and uh, and sigma. And the reason they are called this way is because the electric part of the Weyl tensor uh, is the derivative of sigma, and the magnetic part is the derivative of KAB. So um, in addition to uh, this phase space, in order to have a well-defined action principle, you need to add additional conditions on K. Uh, that's what uh, Compare and the hook have uh, shown, uh, as well as Virmani. Um, so you need K to be traceless and divergent. So before going to the action principle, um, let me just say something about asymptotic symmetries because that's of course important. Uh, so at null infinity, you know that there are super translations and at spatial infinity, there is a counterpart of that called uh, spy super translations. There are they, they are basically a shift in the radial coordinate uh, parameterized by some function omega. So it's a, it's a three dimension. I mean, it's a function uh, valued over, um, let's say, the Dositor hyperboloid. Uh, and it has to satisfy some uh, constraint equation, which looks like the Klein Gordon equation for uh, some negative mass. And uh, the way it acts on the, on the fields uh, is simple. So it does not act on, the, on sigma nor the, the Sitor metric, but uh, it does act on the magnetic potential. And in fact, there is a one-to-one -one, uh, correspondence with super translations at null infinity. Uh, so if now we restrict to non-radiative space times, which we do for simplicity, then KAB can be written in terms of a single scalar function, uh, which has to satisfy the same uh, Klein-Gordon equation as the symmetry parameter. And in fact, this phi is the spy super translation Golson because it, it simply shifts under uh, spy super translation. Uh, now, of course, many of you would like to know how to relate this structure to the one at null infinity, and that's possible. So if we adopt the bondy gauge, then there is the uh, shear, CAB. And for non-radiative space-time, CAB can again uh, also, sorry, can also be expressed in terms of a scalar function C that we call the super translation Golson, uh, because it also shifts under super translations. This guy is valued over the celestial sphere, while the previous one was valued over the Dositor hyperboloid. But there is a relation between the two, uh, namely that C is the limit of phi uh, as you go to the future of the of the Dositor hyperboloid, uh, and similarly for the uh, symmetry parameters. And in fact, you can either go uh, either take the limit of phi to the future of the hyperboloid or to the past of it, uh, and that allows you to to derive the antipodal matching condition that uh, Andy um, advocated uh, in in two thousand three. 13. Uh, okay. So that's the, the phase space, if you like. Now I can tell you about the action principle. So already in 2005, uh, Mann and Marholf proposed an action for gravity near spatial infinity. So there is the Einstein Hilbert term, of course. Uh, and there is a boundary term located on the De Sitter hyperboloid, uh, which contains the usual Gibbons-Hawking term, 
and an intrinsic boundary term uh, that I'm not going to uh, detail. Um, but this is not enough because if you look at the on shell variation of uh, this action, you see that there is no bulk term, there is no uh, boundary term, uh, three dimensional boundary term, but there are corner terms that uh, localize on the celestial sphere. And these are logarithmically divergent. Uh, and what Compare and the Hook uh, realized is that this is the reason why, I mean, this leads to uh, a logarithmically divergent symplectic structure for general relativity, which is, of course, uh, a problem. So they proposed an additional uh, renormalization of the action. Uh, so, right, so in, in here, uh, you have in, on this, in the second line, you have a total variation. So this, you, these terms, you just have to remove. Uh, but to cancel the first line, uh, you have to add uh, some special boundary counter term that I call the compare the hook uh, counter term. And it's localized again on the uh, three-dimensional, the Sitor hyperboloid. So it's logarithmically divergent. Uh, there is one piece which is a functional of the electric potential. And there is one piece which is a functional of the magnetic potential. Um, and with that, then the renormalized, the, yeah, the renormalized on shell action is infrared finite. The symplectic structure is infrared finite. Uh, and everything looks good. So, but that's not our work. So what we thought is that um, this counter term knows about uh, the infrared divergences of the theory. And in addition, it's a functional of uh, the magnetic potential, which contains the super translation Goldson. So it's very likely that it knows something interesting about the super translation Goldson. Uh, and indeed, it turns out that it does. So what we, um, right, so this I just said. So what we did, uh, a bit in the spirit of the ADS-CFT correspondence, is take this compare the hook uh, boundary action, evaluate it on shell in the absence of uh, radiation for simplicity, and see what it can uh, teach us. So what can we expect? Uh, this compare the hook action is a three-dimensional one uh, defined over the Decitor hyperbola. So when you evaluate it on shell, you expect to reduce it to, uh, to um, an action uh, at the boundaries of the Decitor hyperbola. But these boundaries are precisely the celestial sphere. So you expect a two-dimensional theory on the celestial sphere, uh, which sounds uh, well, sounds to go in the right direction, of course. Okay, so what we have to do is very simple. We uh, take the magnetic potential k. We write it in terms of phi because we are looking at non-radiative space times. Then we have to solve the constraint on phi, which is just a Klein-Gordon equation on the Decitor hyperbola. Uh, we also have to solve the equation of motion for the electric potential, which is actually the same one. And to solve this equation, we put coordinates on uh, the hyperbola. So we use planar coordinates. Eta is the conformal time on the Decitor space, and x i is uh, stereographic coordinate for the two sphere. Uh, and now we just have to solve the Klein Gordon equation. So we know from the ADS CFT correspondence that we can use some sort of uh, Pfefferman gram expansion for phi. 
Um, and so this Pfefferman gram expansion um, involves a series of uh, functions on the, on the two sphere. And we can solve all of them in terms of phi naught and phi four. We can solve locally, uh, right, in terms of phi naught and phi four. So these uh, seem to be the important fields. And indeed, we can show that phi naught is just um, the super translation Goldstone mode of null infinity written in well, stereographic coordinates. So that's why there is this uh, plane in index here. Uh, and notice that, well, using the usual argument of the ADS-CFT correspondence, you can directly associate uh, dimension minus one to this guy and dimension three to this guy. And indeed, uh, this is the correct dimension for the, the super translation goes to mode. Uh, and uh, it's very interesting that there is a dimension three operator because this is uh, what appears in the gold in the uh, right goldstone diamond of uh, Sabrina, Andrea, and Emilio. But okay, I don't have uh, much more to say about it. Um, all right, so now that we've solved the equations of motion, we just plug this back into the compare the hook uh, action. And this we call the infrared effective action. And it turns out that uh, it only depends on the super translation goals. It's a very simple action. It's uh, defined on the celestial sphere. Uh, it's logarithmically divergent. So there is this lambda, which is uh, the ratio of the outer uh, IR cutoff and the inner uh, cutoff. So it's dimensionless. Uh, and it has a number of interesting properties. So first of all, uh, it's invariant under global conformal transformations, but not local ones. It's extremized by uh, translation configurations. So by this, I mean uh, C equal one Z, Z bar, or Z, Z bar, uh, which are also the global solutions of this equation of motion, box squared C equals zero. And more importantly, or importantly at least, it yields the two-point function that we were after. So this uh, CC, which goes like uh, G x square log x. So this you can either say is the Groen's function of this equation of motion, or uh, is the two point function that you get if you use this action uh, in the path integral definition of this two point function. Um, so that was our like main objective and uh, well, I think it's interesting to see that we can get this two-point function at the same time, see that it's, uh, well, you, you can derive it from general relativity and it's tied to the infrared divergence sector of uh, general relativity, as well as to the infrared divergence sector of uh, scattering amplitudes. Uh, and so finally, uh, I would like to discuss some further compelling um, fact, which is that you can use this infrared effective action in a path integral formulation of uh, the soft factors, uh, which is a, 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 right, a formulation of the soft factors that is intrinsically two-dimensional. Evan, you've got so, about five minutes. Right, OK, good. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'll get there, I think. Uh, so we have these soft factors that can be written as the expectation value of a product of uh, vertex operators. Um, but instead of comparing with Weinberg results and deriving and inferring the two-point function of C from that, we can postulate 
path integral definition for, for, for this quantity. So we can say, okay, this expectation value uh, can be written as a path integral, where the path integral runs over the, the Goldstone mode. And the weight factor in the path integral is the infrared effective action. Uh, now the infrared effective action is quadratic, so it's uh, very straightforward to evaluate this path integral. And what you get is Weinberg's result, uh, which I think is uh, right, quite compelling. It's much simpler. In fact, it's a one line, one line computation. Um, and that's pretty much uh, all I wanted to, to tell you. So let me just conclude with a summary and some open questions. Uh, so here we are, we've used a setup that is appropriate to describe nonlinear gravity, neurospatial infinity. Um, looking at the well-posed action principle um, of compare and the hook, we've identified what piece controls and regulates the IR divergences. And from that, uh, we have derived the infrared effective action that governs the support translation Golson mode and the IR divergent sector of uh, uh, scattering amplitudes and arguably uh, the Celestial CFT. And in particular, there is an intrinsic path integral formulation of, uh, of the Celestial CFT, at least of the, of the soft factors. Um, so what are the open questions? Well, one could say that there is, uh, I mean, that the full action for GR is IR finite. Uh, indeed, compare and the hook have, uh, well, renormalized action. So it's, uh, after renormalization, it's, it's uh, finite. And then there would, not, there would be no Infrared, uh, infrared effective action. And I think this is very analogous to the fact that there is a formalism for scattering amplitudes where there is also no uh, IR divergence when you use dressed, uh, dressed field, a la Fadeyev and Kulich. Uh, every step of the way, uh, your IR is safe and you don't have to talk about uh, the two-point function of super translation goes to mode. So I think there was a, a close uh, analogy here, although there was probably more to say about it. Uh, then it's interesting that uh, the technology of the DS3 CFT2 correspondence shows up in the in the computation. So we we have naturally we we're led to consider fields on three-dimensional the sitter space and we uh, we evaluate the action on shell uh, using the Pfefferman gram expansion we see that uh, in this Pfefferman gram expansion there is uh, the operator of pi naught which has dimension minus one which is the uh, Golson mode and then there is another operator pi four which has dimension three uh, which could be the, um, the operator which appears in the Goldstone diamond of, uh, of Sabrina, Andrea, and Emilio. But again, uh, well, I, I think there was more to say about this. Uh, finally, um, we've not considered radiation, and it could be natural to try to generalize uh, our computation. And what we would expect is that the infrared effective action would then contain a uh, coupling between the Goldstone mode and uh, radiation. But we have not done this yet. So, um, right then, okay, so that's, that's all I had to say. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Kevin, for a great talk. That's all, then. Kevin, and we have plenty of time for questions. So feel free to just unmute yourselves.
go ahead along. Uh, hi, Kevin. So yeah, my question was about this, um, uh, that, that in the earlier paper of Henry and Schrominger and others, they look at this commutation relation of the, you know, the constant C mode with the soft news, um, which, I mean, the commutator also went exactly as like Z square log Z square, right? So kind of the correlator that you got for the C with C, I mean, it looked like what you would also get for C with the soft news, right? Uh, I was wondering if you thought about that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know about that. Um, but I, yeah, I don't have much to say about this here. What we've been able to, to do is to uh, derive an action for the super translation also mode, which yields the, the, uh -huh. the, the x square log, log x two point function, but we, we don't have much to say about radiation because we, we haven't considered it. I see. Mm -hmm. But from, from the from the quantization, it looked like the correlator of two point function of the C with the, you know, the N zero would also be have the same form. I mean, the dependence on the celestial points would be the same. So a bit curious. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. But yeah, I don't I don't have something to say about that. Thanks. So have you thought about doing this analysis for non-abelian gauge theory, just uh, sort of classical analysis with the action? Uh, the natural guess would seem to be just a G nonlinear sigma model or something like that. But... Yeah, we, we, haven't, uh, we haven't done it. Um, but yeah, I guess uh, something similar could happen or would probably happen. Um, yeah, we, we, I mean, we are very focused on gravity, so that, that's the reason, but uh, it would definitely be worth doing it. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it seems like your action basically just, it gives an action to the local super translations, but remains invariant under the, the global part, so. Right, right, right. Go ahead, Lorenzo. Yes, hi, Kevin. Uh, hi. I, I missed out uh, uh, an important part of what, what you said. Can you show again the infrared effective action that, uh, that leads to the Weinberg formula? Right, right. OK, so this is like a box squared, right? So it's a, it's yes, a, a, yes. like, a, like a, a free boson in some sense, but with a, for derivatives, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, in 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 regards to mapping this to a gauge theory, uh, there was this work by Kalyanapuram that uh, uh, got like you know, of course, you know, your C as an interpretation, huh? but uh, he got a similar action just from the idea of double copying QED. So he uh, he got uh, like a free boson for QED, which uh, admits then a non-abelian generalization and then if you just you know play the double pop the game then you get an action with box squared and then the, the crucial thing is that when, once you have box squared then you get wider it's almost uh, automatic yeah uh, right right as, as, so uh, just, um, just an observation yeah right. yeah no maybe, that's maybe that's one way back into the right uh can you so can you repeat what, what is that paper? What are the authors? Authors? Yeah, I can, uh, maybe I can send you the, the, the link in the chat, uh, if okay, I can <laughs> work it out. But you know, I, I can do it in a few minutes now. I don't have to. Yeah, okay, so, okay. Thanks. I know that sounds, uh, yeah, that sounds about right. All right, do we have any other questions?
Uh, all right. Well, if not, then let's thank Kevin again for a great talk. Thank you. Uh, and I think we have a little break before the next set of Yes. Talks. And after the break, uh, we'll take over with uh, Will Spence, who will be in the uh, chair. Okay. Thank you very much, Daniel. Andros, maybe you can uh, stop the recording. Kevin, I sent you the link to the paper if you are still listening. Okay, thanks. I'll have a look at it. Thanks a lot. Yep.